Isabel Miller is a PhD candidate at Kingston University, having done her MA in Psychosocial Studies at Birkbeck before that. She's researching Lacan, Sex, and Artificial Intelligence, and the paper that um, she's presenting today is different from what's in your program, it's slightly adjusted, Kant avec Saad, the apocalypse of sex. So let's welcome Isabel. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so this paper is extracted from my uh, PhD research from a, a larger chapter um, uh, in which I, I asked three Kantian questions in relation to sex and artificial intelligence. And this particular chapter is, uh, is the Kantian question, what should we do? So, uh, Baudrillard famously asked, what are you doing after the orgy? In this paper, I'll explore this apocalyptic question with recourse to Lacan's essay, Kant of Exard, and a reading of the film, Ghost in the Shell, in which the question of artificial intelligence and the fantasy of the undead body is depicted. Popular discourses on the future of AI have focused on either the terrifying notion of the singularity, that moment when AI becomes autonomous and overtakes humankind on the one hand, or on the other, techno-utopian dreams of the radical potential of cyborgian subjectivity. My reading, however, will attempt to explore the relationship between the concept of AI and its relationship to sexuation in the psychoanalytic sense. I will argue that in the notion of the sex robot, we may perceive the positing of the apocalypse of sex. Sexuality, I will argue, is a privileged vehicle through which we can start to think of the relationship between AI and the apocalypse. Fantasies of the sex robot have been developing in culture, literature, film, and now really in AI over decades. I argue that the concept of the sex robot when taken to its speculative zenith combines the extimate notions of enjoyment and the law via the challenge to subjectivity that artificial intelligence poses. The apocalypse, if we look at its etymology, is not so much the positing of a radical catastrophe, but rather a revelation from the Greek apocalyptain, unveiling or disclosure. In terms of the Lacanian grasp of sexuation, this co corresponds to the masculine exception as an endpoint or singularity, being subsumed by the feminine open set. This paper reads the female sex robot as exemplary of this logical relationship between sex, knowledge and the law. In what follows, I'll imagine the Lacanian prolegomena for any future sex robot ethics, given that the law and jouissance are for Lacan inexorably connected. Furthermore, Ghost in the Shell, I'll argue, reveals apocalyptic Sardian universe residing inside the seemingly most innocuous fantasies of robot bodies that prevail in contemporary culture. In a blazing assault on the foundations of enlightenment values and rationality, Lacan's Count of Exard attempts to read the infamous French Marquis as the consummate Kantian, and in doing so, uncover the structural logic underpinning both the virgin philosopher of Old Königsberg and the libertine novelist Ethics. Published just eight years after Immanuel Kant's critique of practical reason, Sard's philosophy in the boudoir details the depraved acts inflicted by a band of libertines on their virtuous and beautiful victim, Eugène de Misteval. And is, Lacan argues, not just an extension of Kant's ethics, but its completion. Sard shows us the disturbing truth of Kantian ethics that he himself had failed to recognise. But rather than the more obvious route of trying to prove the existence of bad intentions in the Kantian categorical imperative, Lacan is more interested in locating a solid adherence to an ethical maxim in the Sardian fantasy. For Kant, the ultimate objective of the moral law is the realisation of the supreme good, the point at which virtue and happiness coincide. But by renouncing all emotional factors as pathological in the moral realm, Kant paved the way for a system of ethics which exposed the true and hideous face of jouissance and its structuring as the other side of the law, Kant proposes the establishment of a law which excludes any consideration of the relation between subject and object and the capacity for the latter to produce pleasure or displeasure in the former, but rather is based upon the extent to which the subject's will is in accordance with an a priori law. Following this logic, Lacan is able to discern in the barbaric and licentious acts of Sars libertines a certain adherence to a strict moral code which is articulated in the form of a maxim, which one enunciated takes its, as its foundation the acknowledgement of the other's supreme right to dominion over one's body, such that, quote, I have the right to enjoy your body, anyone can say to me, and I will exercise this right without any limit to the capriciousness of the exactions I may wish to satiate with your body. 
In highlighting the position of the enunciated I in this maxim as not the subject but the voice of law, Lacan proceeds to analyse its value as a universal and unconditional categorical imperative. In the Sardian universe, the right to jouissance is dependent upon the non-negotiable inequality between victim and aggressor in any sexual configuration. Nearly 60 years later, and in light of our increasingly apocalyptic technological landscape, the question of sexual enjoyment and ethics has become ever more problematised. As cultural fantasies about robot sex draw closer to our grasp, we must ask what the future entails for these new configurations of sex and AI. Lacan's groundbreaking contribution to the ethical debate, Kant of Exard, whilst well used in the literature on psychoanalytic ethics, has yet to be employed in relation to the female robot and its significance in human relationships. As sex becomes further technologised, we must inquire after the structure of enjoyment that drives it. If, if Sard's libertine's fantasies of a perpetual victim grow out of their fascination with the second death, the inescapable law of castration, how would the immortality of the female robot body and potential for endless torment feature as a mode of fantasy for the desires of the libertines? What kind of ethics can be built around the assumption of a subject who does not know castration and who supposedly cannot suffer? And is the sex robot the Sardian ethical imperative incarnate? As Lacan posits, in contrast to Kant's practical reason, the Sardian moral experience revolves entirely around jouissance. Lacan's point is that the object of the moral law is materialised in the figure of the libertine tormentor. As it's, sorry, materialised, it loses its Kantian inaccessibility. As distinct from the Kantian moral law as outside the realm of sensory experience, in the Sardian view, the law is an abstract point of omission which nevertheless presents itself as a disembodied voice, heard but not seen and always to be obeyed. As Dolmonsay puts it, whilst waiting for his victim Eugenie to regain consciousness after a bout of torturous activities, if as merely the blind instruments of its inspirations, nature ordered us to set the universe ablaze, the sole crime would be to resist, and all the scoundrels on earth are purely the agents of nature's caprice. The tragedy, though, for the libertines is that no matter how heinous or depraved their actions, their jouissance is but a pale imitation of the imagined enjoyment they would, they would receive from executing the perfect crime, that is, of eternal suffering inflicted on their victims, along with the eternal ability to witness it, and more fundamentally, the fantasy of their own death. Of course, the obvious barrier to this possibility is the brute fact of the limitations of the human body and its ability to endure torment and destruction. So as Lacan puts it, the libertines have to admit that the humility of an act in which he cannot help but become a being of flesh and to the very marrow a slave to pleasure. Unquote. In other words, the libertines, when all is said and done, can never achieve the full satisfaction they desire because it's always thwarted by the very human cycles of excitement and orgasm that are ultimately and inevitably always returning back to the state of equilibrium. So could we not say that the ultimate pleasure for the libertine is not in fact just death, but immortality, to be the undead. In which case, perhaps the libertine will not wish to have a sex robot, but to be one. Rupert Sanders' 2017 film, Ghost in the Shell, allows us to explore the question of the body and suffering in relation to AI, and ask how the Sardian imperative may help us to understand our fascination with the fantasy of the automated female body. Ghost in the Shell depicts a near dystopian future where the everyday texture of reality is interspersed with simulations much like a walk through a Baudrillardian landscape, and humans live alongside AI in multiple forms of embodiment, both humanoid and monstrous. Like so many recent cinematic visions of cyborgian life, we are enthralled by a beautiful feminine protagonist. In this case, it's Scarlett Johansson portraying the character of anti-terrorism operative Major Killian. Killian is supposedly neither human nor AI. After an accident which destroyed her human body, she has been reanimated from the merging of her brain with an entirely synthetic body, her brain, however, completely intact. She soon discovers that the story she was told about her origins is all a lie. Killian's life was in fact stolen. It becomes clear, though, through the visions she experiences as glitches, that her own memories have resisted complete annihilation after her organic brain was uploaded in her new synthetic body. But what way may we glean from the depiction of the augmented female body in its relation to questions of the subjectivity of Killian? How does the film deal with the problem of Killian's lost past? In what ways does the character of Major Killian speak to the question of sexuation in relation to the Sardian universe of undead enjoyment? What is retained by Killian after her reanimation is her subject position, an indelible stain in the fabric of reality that cannot be substitute, substituted nor lost. 
However, she appears strangely devoid of enjoyment, given that she cannot feel physical sensation. But is this really the case? Can it be that Killian does in fact enjoy? Like so many depictions of female robots, is what we're in fact being asked to imagine an articulation of feminine jouissance, the logic of which supposedly escapes castration. It would seem her primary source of suffering, though, still revolves around an originary loss, an impossible object that her reincarnated body still mourns after. No surprise, then, that the film ends with Killian being reunited with her mother, her original lost object. This is just one of the many cinematic instances where the female body is put to work in pursuit of an answer to the question of the relationship between sex and the law. Hence why only when she's fulfilling her purpose as ultimate weapon, she is naked and eroticized. Killian is not just a sexualized female body, she is a superhuman one. The fantasy of the undead body that Ghost in the Shell depicts is described by Lacan in Position of the Unconscious and Seminar 11, where he speaks of the mythical L'Omelette. He then further characterizes it as the lamella, that strange amoeba that leaves the body at the time of birth when the child is separated from the placenta. He asks us to imagine a phantom, infinitely more primal form of life that would take flight away from the newborn. This crep-like form is the remainder of the subject before it comes sexed. He says, the lamella is something that is related to what the sex being loses in sexuality. Immortal life, irrepressible life, life that has no need of organ, simplified, indestructible life. It is precisely what is subtracted from the living being by virtue of the fact that it is subject to the cycle of sex reproduction. And it is of this that all the forms of the object A, object A can be enumerated, are the representatives, the equivalents. Unquote. So the lamella has no sensory system, no need for partial drives, oral, anal, scopic or invocatory, synthesising all these aspects into one complete plenitude of pure satisfaction, in other words, pure enjoyment. A logical impossibility, of course, yet whose originary loss provides the formal conditions for the structure of the sex being. It is the very thing that inhabits the eschatological fantasies of the singularity, that moment when humankind is replaced by an immortal and indestructible digital form of life. As Ghost in the Shell epitomises, the character of Major Killian is similarly the fantasy of the undead, indestructible silicone life form. But ultimately this, as with all attempts at breaching castration, fails. So what is it in the subject that remains indestructible? To return to Sard's philosophy in the boudoir, the action also centres around the complete erasure of a, a previous form of subjectivity and the explosive discovery of new forms of jouissance of the exquisite female protagonist, Eugenie. It is significant that her primary cause of suffering and indeed the victim of the culmination of her most depraved fantasies is her own mother. It's her mother whose unbearable virtuousness causes Eugenie to be caught between her own so-called natural desires and the restrictions put upon her by society. Horrifyingly, it's with the rape and torture of her mother that Eugenie supposedly fulfills her ultimate desire. Whilst, of course, Killian does nothing of the sort, the character of Dr. Hulet, who fulfills the role of Killian's new mother, is blamed and killed by the CEO of Hanker once Killian has gone rogue. But Killian's relationship to her real mother is one of pure enigma. Her biological mother ties her to her human mortality and her indelible subject position as stain on reality. Yet her second prosthetic mother, Dr. Hulet, redesigns her and facilitates her escape from the second death, the laws of castration, much like Madame de Saint-Ange attempts to redesign Eugenie in line with different laws. Her new body allows Killian to live outside of the restrictions of pleasure and pain which her biological body, as given to her by her first mother, first mother could not accommodate. As revolting and brutal as appetites of Sard's libertines are, we may nonetheless see their ontology present in the film Ghost in the Shell. What kind of fantasy victim would Killian represent? A body that can't die, it can suffer indefinitely, unfettered by the limits of human biological cycles. And what kind of subject is Killian? Does she have a history? And does this form the basis of her suffering and her enjoyment? Is this not the Sardian ethical dream of ultimate satisfaction? Or is this pervert's dream or the Sardis dream? In Sard's dark satire on contemporary French moralizing and its class politics, Eugenie ends the story in spectacularly gruesome fashion. It is undoubtedly infinitely more graphic and explicitly violent towards the mother than Ghost in the Shell, but what seems to be at stake and under erasure in both stories is the position of the mother as sole progenitor and moral guardian of the species. For Saad, the mother as the holy grail of religious discourse and morality must be desecrated. 
Whilst for Ghost in the Shell, the mother occupies an ambivalent role, supposedly the origin of Killian subjectivity, but ultimately limiting to the progression of the species. This sketches out another crucial factor in the Sardian ethics, which hinges on male and female sexuation. It is precisely the hypermateriality of the female body that acts as veil for the negativity of being which the Sardian libertine cannot bear. As Zizek puts it, this redoubling of the body into the common mortal body and the ethereal undead body brings us to the crux of the matter. The distinction between the two deaths, the biological death and the, of the common mortal body and the death of the other undead body, it is clear that what Sard aims at in his notion of a radical crime is the murder of this second body. What Sard missed and Lacan realised is precisely that these two deaths come in reverse order. For Sard's libertines, the universe is pure substance without subject. They still believe in the big other and nature as ontologically consistent realm. Therefore, according to Zizek, Sard continues to grasp reality only as substance and not also as subject, where subject does not stand for another ontological level different from substance, but for the imminent incompleteness, inconsistency, antagonism of substance itself. So Killian is our ultimate fantasy of a sex robot embodying the irreconcilable irre trauma of subjectivity that full automation cannot capture. Killian is both the indestructible killer and the perpetually killed. The law and enjoyment as first, first problematized by Lacan is brought to a conclusion in the figure of the undead body. Major Killian may be augmented in the form of an invincible non-biological body, but her humanity appears precisely at the point where satisfaction fails. Her search for the memories that escape her grasp point to a structure of fantasy that yearns after various lost objects, or one in particular. The prosthetic god that Freud once postulated also dreamt hubristically of not suffering the effects of castration, does not die and is not born. From the point of view of the Sardian universe, Killian is the ultimate victim, a futuristic Eugène de Mistaval. Not only is, a Killian of, is Killian an impeccable body of alabaster virtue, perpetually unscathed and virginal, yet inhumanly strong, but she also has the capacity to suffer indefinitely and probably can't die. Is this perhaps the start of a sex robot ethics? It's here that the apocalyptic nature of sex comes to the fore. Apocalypse or unveiling is what the libertine's incessant desire for ever more obscenity invokes, a radical unveiling which would finally breach the bounds of impossible knowledge, that of the sexual relation.